Now, you know, the most profound thing that you may take away from this uh, service today may very well have been that which uh, little Nathan spoke this morning. I don't know if you got to hear Nathan tell you uh, this morning, he said, Jesus never takes turns. <laughs> wow. Could we old people hear that? Because what happens, we insist on taking charge sometimes, don't we? We want to be at the front of the line, the leader of our lives. And when we do that, how many know we mess up? How many know we, it's really a bad mistake? So, so Nathan may have very well preached the best sermon you're going to hear today. So, so uh, and I accept that. That's the way the Lord sure works in mysterious ways. Uh, a few years ago, I, I stood in this uh, cave right here. That's the cave of John, uh, the, John the Revelator, uh, overlooking the Aegean Sea. And uh, we stood in that cave as a, as a tour group and, and got to sing Amazing Grace. And those words bellowing out of that little hole in the, in the rock was, was quite an, a, an amazing thing. And God begins to speak through John in, in the book of Revelation that we read. And it was some of the worst times in Christian history as he began to speak. Patmos was really a place of, uh, a place of exile. It was a place, uh, not a nice place. It was a place where they'd put prisoners and you just, you just kind of stranded on this, little, on this little island. But his writings today provide a great source of, of power for us to, to, li to live out this very day and while we journey toward the fulfillment of God's kingdom and, and the ultimate plan that God has for each of our lives. John was speaking to the seven churches. Now, I know for a fact there was more than seven churches in Asia. So, so in my opinion, he's speaking to seven being in symbols. Seven is a complete number, the wholeness and fullness of seven. So in my opinion, and many others' opinion, by the way, he was speaking to the church universal, the cosmic church of Jesus Christ. Which, so those words that he, that he has written all those years ago, they still very much apply to our our lives. That message is still valid, to, valid today. And he begins in Re Re Revelation 1. He, be he begins, I feel like uh, Bugs Bunny, but, but, but I'll, I'll get over it. I'm getting ahead of myself. He, he begins, grace to you and peace from whom he is, who is and was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. That number seven once again comes up as, as the notion of wholeness and fullness, the power of God in all of his fullness. He's describing the God of infinity, who, who is and was and will always be, the God of eternity. And he goes on to say, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. One of my favorite phrases in all of the scripture, from the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. These verses have been one of my favorite verses even before I was a Christian. My mom gave me a little pack of cassette tapes of a preacher one day, and I was driving back and forth to work, 45-minute drive back before I was ever, ever a pastor, and I was listening to those tapes, and I can show you the place on Route 10 in 1985, in September of 1985, where I heard these verses for the very first time. I was ready to pull off the road. The Lord had been dealing with me, and the Lord was uh, bubbling up inside my spirit as to the direction of my life and how important it is for us to know who we are to know who we are. It's important how you talk to yourself. It's important how you see yourself. It's important that you understand that the Spirit of God working in you and the power of God that is in you to, that, that is to radiate out of your spirit. It's very important that you understand who you are. And we're called to be kings and priests. So these verses are very, are very special to me. The reason he describes Jesus as the firstborn of the dead is, is really to, to refer to the resurrection. Jesus come out of the grave. He was number one. And then there was a number two and a number three and a number four. And all down through the generations, there's a number and you have that number. If you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart, you're one of those born from the resurrection. You're raised unto new life in Jesus Christ. 
We follow Jesus into that same resurrection. That's the, the birthing again of our spirit. We're born again of the Spirit of God, and it is that which raises us. The same power that, pulled, that raised Jesus out of the grave is the same power that's working in you this very morning. Thus we have a number as well. Thus, thus we fall into the long line of those that have been purchased by the very lifeblood of Jesus Christ. And then the next verse ought to make any one of you stand up and take note. And has made us kings and priests. Now who's the us? Right here. Right here. You. You before my voice are kings and priests to his God the Father. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus' resurrection not only gave us life, but has raised us up to be kings and priests by the very notion we have a very high calling from, to lead people into the kingdom of God. We have a calling to be kings and priests from God. Kings and priests by their very title are leaders in their community but not to lead in any way, but specifically to lead to the righteousness by the righteousness and the power of God. Humans were created in the image of God to be a leader. We're all called to be a leader. No creature is like humans in the whole of creation. So our leadership comes from our relationship with God and is not for your benefit. It is for the benefit of of the kingdom of God. But all we do is to bring glory to God. And all we do, he has entrusted us to be leaders. Probably the closest analogy we would have that we might understand, we're called to be executive vice presidents. God's people are to move through creation under the rule of God, leading people to obey the same righteous God that we've been called to lead and follow. We're not building something in our image, but the image of Almighty God. Real leadership is leading with the character of God for God's purposes. Central to the church's responsibilities is to develop leaders in the kingdom of God. And to be honest, the church as a whole has not been effective. We always see this pendulum in church history swinging back from a real heavy clergy note, a heavy clergy back all the way back to, to, to a light clergy or heavy lay leadership. We've got to learn to understand that I'm not here. You don't pay me to, be, to do your spiritual stuff. I'm here as your spiritual leader, not to do it for you. I can't do that which you're called to do by your own calling because you, you are called to minister. You are called to lead. You're called to go into the world and proclaim the gospel. You're called to be salt and light in the world. I've been under a great deal of conviction recently focusing on leadership and what that means and leadership style and the Holy Spirit has been, has been moving mightily in my heart over the last, uh, the last few months. It's created a passion that we as the church, we, we're sitting in the place that our ancestors sat and they paved the way for us to be here. They stepped up, and they were leaders in their community. They stepped up that we might be here today. And now, you've got a generation of kids that you see before you, and you're called to lead them the same way. I, I know that we at this church and the leadership of this church, we're all committed in 2017 to begin developing leaders like we've never done before. I think that's what we're called to do, that this church can be maintained and perpetuated for just another 20 years because we're never more than one generation away from extinction. We'll be working hard to identify and nurture the next generation of leaders. That is our goal and purpose for 2017. For the kingdom of God is about God's reign. It's about God's rule. Our mission is to make disciples and lead people into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. In Mark, in Mark's gospel, he says, Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Therefore, the thing we receive, the thing we receive is the rule of God in our lives. Thank you, Nathan. God don't take turns. <laughs> God don't take turns being leader. Jesus is either the leader of all of your life or he's not the leader of any of your life. 
most miserable people you'll ever see is the people that have a foot in the world and a foot in the church, and they live in that, co- that constant dichotomy, that which those, those competing forces, those are called miserable people. It's a miserable place to be to have your allegiance split and divided. In order to enter the great realm of God's rule, we must submit ourselves completely to God's rule and to God's reign in our lives. Salvation is not just a glorious and amazing event in our lives. Salvation is a verb. It's an action word where we're called to allow God to continually move, forever move in our lives. It's also much more than receiving forgiveness and justifying sinners. But it's a great work of adoption that God calls us into his family. We're royally adopted as kings and priests into the very kingdom of God as we transfer our citizenship into an eternal kingdom. We read in Colossians, For he has rescued us, that's us, from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this community, this new kingdom in Lewisburg, West Virginia, must be dedicated to develop and deploy the people of God to lead adopted, adopted family, adopted people, kings and priests. The world is in desperate need of leaders to guide them out of the darkness that they find themselves so engulfed in. So wherever you are, whatever your daily task is at, at, the, at the job or wherever you are, you are called to be salt and light in the midst of that. For we see the tragic results of the world living apart from the reign of God. It's more than just living independent of God, but, but actively living under the role, the rule of Satan and sin. Unbelievers are part of a perverse and wicked generation and kingdom that kills and steals and destroys the life of our family and our neighbors and our loved ones. We have witnessed and lived out the results of slavery to sin in both our personal lives and the lives of those we see around us. We have witnessed, surely the the self-evident fact for all of us is the fact that sin destroys our lives. We witness the worst kind of tyranny, as we see this horrible darkness around the world. The hearts of God's people break every time we see that. We we witness that destruction of so much, so much destruction all around us. The only hope we have to be delivered from this tyranny is to proclaim and live out the kingdom of God. When King Jesus comes on the scene and he adopts you as his mommy always called me youngins, a youngin. He adopts you as a son or a daughter. Another reality begins to take shape in our lives. A new and glorious kingdom begins to to develop and it's dedicated to the rule of God that is based upon His wonderful, amazing grace. We are the kings and priests of God that are called to to that glorious and wonderful responsibility that we've been given that unspeakable delight to help others enter in to the kingdom of God, that they may escape the darkness. We work hard to help people reject the sin and enter the joy of God's reign. We know the great commission of Matthew 28 to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. The proclamation is the very essence of Christian leadership. J.L. Packer said it this way. He said, the task of the church is to make the invisible kingdom visible through faithful Christian living and and witness and witness bearing. Just the fact that you're here. Just the fact that you're a member of this local church makes you a leader. God's church is leading the world into the glorious mercy and grace of God. Not only are church leaders called to be leaders themselves, but churches must equip leaders. Churches are called to nurture and develop that leadership. All too often the church has failed at this task. The church often makes followers, but not great leaders. God's leadership applies to every sphere of our lives. Everywhere your foot goes is holy ground because there's a saint of God that dwells over top of that foot. 
You're to be a Christian leader at your daily task. Your home, your job, your community, every place you have a voice. Let's have a voice in the reign of the life of God. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He said, he said every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. That ought to convict every one of us. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. The power of God cannot be defeated. Some of the greatest testimonies that I've ever witnessed was in the presence of the most difficult and horrible times I've ever seen when unbelievers witness God's people leading with confidence, when God's, when God's people step up in the face of unbelievers and they see the joy and the grace through adversity. They're captivated. They're held by the very grace of God. John Stott said it this way. He said, we should not ask what is wrong with the world for that diagnosis has already been given. Rather, we should ask, what has happened to salt and light in the world? That's what I want to leave you with. We go from this place to be salt and light and do what God has designed you to do, leading people to salvation into the light of God's dear Son. In 1 John, he tells us, Beloved now, we are children of God. We are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall see him as he is. We shall see God. So I'm speaking to salt and light. I'm speaking to the leaders of this community in every way. Every way. Step up in your professional life. Step up in your work life. Step up in your customer life. Step up in whatever you're doing that you may be salt and light to a hurting world. Go now and be the king and the priest, the son and the daughter of God that you've been called to be. Amen.